Now we've categorized all these particles, what we need to do is to see the point of all this. Well, the main point is to apply these conservation laws. So we need to know what properties are conserved in an interaction. Okay, if you think about what you know about physics from the past, things like the conservation of energy maybe is the first one you do back in year seven. Right, that's a really fundamental idea that's actually very helpful for us to work out what can and can't happen in situations. So the conservation laws in particle physics are also very, very important for us to know what is possible and what's not possible. So we can look at equations and we can say, oh, that might happen, or we can say, no, there's no way that that could ever happen. So things that we already know that are conserved, well, we know charge is always conserved, and we know momentum is always conserved. Right? You will have learned lower down that mass and energy are two more quantities conserved, but because we've now looked at this equation, E equals mc squared, we know that's not quite true, certainly not, um, it's not one that we can apply at, at the level that we're doing, but we do still have this conservation of mass energy. So there is only a certain amount of energy you can produce by destroying mass, if you like, and vice versa. Okay, we've also looked at now baryon number and lepton number. Well, these are two other properties which are also always conserved. So if you've got one baryon before an interaction, then you will always have one baryon afterwards. Same thing applies to leptons. Okay, the tricky part of this is you might be thinking, hang on a minute, we've done pair production and we know we can make an electron and a positron together. Yes, you can, but remember that the antiparticles got a lepton number of minus one in that case. So an electron is plus one, a, a positron is minus one. So the lepton number is still zero. You've got a plus one, the minus one still equals zero. Uh, the other property we've mentioned so far is strangeness. And strangeness is a bit of a tricky one because strangeness is always conserved except for if the interaction involves the weak nuclear force. So we've said that the um, weak nuclear force is a force which is very short range. It's responsible for the decay of um, hadrons. So strangeness is not always conserved in these interactions. Okay, so the only kind of time that applies to exam questions is they might ask you a question like this, so they might say a sigma plus, which is an up-down strange, so have a look at that. Remember, that is a baryon, isn't it, because it's made of three quarks. It decays into a proton, because remember, all uh, baryons do decay into protons eventually, maybe through other ones on the way, but eventually they become protons, and it makes a neutral pion. Okay, explain which interaction is responsible for this decay. Well... We've got beforehand, we've got a sigma plus, which is strange. Afterwards, we've got a proton, which is not strange, and a neutral pion, which is also not strange. So strangeness has not been conserved. Well, the only time strangeness is not conserved is when we use this weak nuclear force. So we can go through an argument. We can say sigma plus is strange. Proton and pion are not strange. So strangeness is not conserved. So it must be the weak nuclear force. Okay, that's really all you need to know about um, the conservation of strangeness. Okay, so before we can do all this stuff, we need to know all these numbers, okay? Most of these you should be pretty familiar with, all right? They're fairly straightforward. Uh, there's just a few little ones to catch you out, so I'll just click you very quickly through these. So a proton is a baryon. It's not a lepton. It's got a charge of plus one. A neutron is a baryon. It's not a lepton. It's got no charge, okay? Just think clearly, okay? Don't, for example, go there that the neutron has got a charge of plus one because it's a baryon. This plus one is to do with it being a baryon. This charge of zero is to do with it having no charge. Okay, the electron's not a baryon. It is a lepton. It's got a charge of minus one. Remember, we're all doing relative charges here, obviously. Uh, the, pi o the pi plus is not a baryon because it's a meson. So remember, it's a hadron. It's a meson. It's not a baryon. Its lepton number is zero because it's not a lepton. It's got a charge of plus one because it's a pi plus. Muon is not a baryon, it is a lepton, it's got a charge of minus one. The neutrino, not a baryon, it is a lepton. Okay, it's got a zero charge, it's neutral. Positron is a not a baryon, it's an anti-lepton, so it's got a lepton number of minus one. It's got a charge of plus one. The antineutrino is not a baryon. It's an anti-lepton, so its lepton number is minus one, it's got no charge. Um, you notice all of those are just, your options are only naught, minus 1 or plus 1, right? Just at the end, an up quark, it's got a baryon number of a third, because it's a third of a baryon. 
It's not a lepton, so it's lepton number zero, and its charge is plus two thirds. The down quark's got a bio number of plus a third again. Again, it's not a lepton. It's got a charge of minus a third. Okay, that's not every particle you need to know, but hopefully that's given you a flavor and you can work out any other particle that you come across just from that classification table that we did in the last lecture, which you really need to learn. So the point of all this is to look at whether things are possible. So here's an example for you. So we've got a proton and a neutrino. They interact to form a neutron and a positron. Is that a possible interaction? Well, first step is to write it out as an equation. So here we go, a proton and a neutrino turn into a neutron and a positron. Right, we have to just be very careful. So here's our charge equation. So a proton is a positive particle. Okay, no plus there to give you a clue. They don't write a plus up there because they expect you to know that a proton is positive. Okay, the neutrino is neutral. The neutron is neutral. The beta plus has got a charge of plus one. You do one plus naught equals naught plus one. That's true. You give yourself a tick. So it is possible according to charge. Here's our second one, baryon number. This is a baryon. This isn't. This is a baryon. This isn't. One plus naught. One plus naught. It works. Third thing that must be conserved is lepton number. Okay, not a lepton. Yes, it is a lepton. Not a lepton. Oh, it's an anti-lepton. So now I've got naught plus one, naught minus one. So overall, that won't work. Okay, obviously two out of three is no good. You have to follow all the conservation laws. So that is not an interaction that could possibly happen. Um, here's some more examples for you to have a go at. So a neutron and neutrino make a proton and a positron. So neutron and neutrino, proton and positron. Okay, here's the charges. Neutral, neutral, plus one, plus one. Okay, that won't work. Okay, obviously as soon as you've proved one of them won't work, that's actually enough. Okay, but just for practice, baryon numbers, one, zero, one, zero, that was okay. Lepton numbers, zero, one, zero, minus one, that also didn't work. Okay, is there a way of changing this to make it work? Well, we need to change two numbers here to make it work, don't we? But if the electron was made instead of a positron, that would make this number minus one and this number plus one, and that would work. Okay, a proton and antiproton, make a pi plus and apply minus. Okay, there's the equation. Let's have a look at it. Charge plus one minus one, plus one minus one. So that works. Baryon number also works. And lepton number also works. There's no leptons there. So there's an interaction, which at least in terms of our conservation laws, is something that could possibly work. Pi plus decays into a positive muon and antineutrino, well they decay, we've only got one thing on the left, so we've got just the pi plus, it's decayed into these two things. Let's have a look, we've got a charge of plus one, plus one and zero. We've got baryon numbers of zero, zero and zero, no baryons involved. We've got lepton numbers of zero, minus one and minus one, oh, that hasn't worked. How could we change it? Well, if we just made the antineutrino into neutrino, that wouldn't affect these two numbers, it would make that into a plus one. So that could work. Okay, a negative k on decays into a positive muon and antineutrino. So here's our equation. Charges minus one, plus one and zero. So we're already um, stuffed. So that one works. There's the lepton number. That one doesn't work. What we, could we do? Well, we need to make that a minus one, really, to make that one work. And we need to make that a plus one. So all we need to do is to change the mu muon, mu plus, the anti-muon into a um, muon. One more example, a muon decays into an electron and two neutrinos, so here's the equation. Okay, there's the charge, that works, there's the baryon number, that works, and there's the lepton number, that doesn't work. How can we change that? Well, leptons are great because if you make that into an anti-lepton, we don't affect those two, but we sort this one out. So we could make an electron, a neutrino, and an anti-neutrino. Okay, so those are um, not too hard, but you do have to be very careful. It's easy to get suckered into the charges when you're writing the, something that which isn't charged, and it's easy to notice things like mu plus is an antiparticle, right? Even though there's no bar above it. So when you're doing um, particles and antiparticles, don't just rely on the bars being there to tell you which it is.